Will the 21st century be an Asian century? Asian countries have close relationships and also close historical ties. And Asia has 59% of the world's population. And now Asia's growth is powered by two large economies, China and India, whose economies are growing very fast and also have very young demographic. So many experts and economists believe Asia probably will return to the global stage as the driving force of global economy. Well, honestly, Asia had always been the driving force of global economy for most of human history. When we entered the 19th century, the West dominated. The West controlled most of the world because of World War II, because of the Industrial Revolution. But since now Asia is growing very fast, people believe Hmm, probably Asia will return as the engine of world's economy, world's growth. Many believe the 19th century belongs to the UK, the 20th century belongs to the United States, and the 21st century probably belongs to Asia. One of the most uh, vocal voice of this idea is senior Singaporean diplomat Professor Kishore Mabubani, who served many terms as Singaporeans' permanent representative to the United Nations. Several years ago, he wrote a book, The Asian's 21st Century. That book, uh, which is open access, had more than 3 million downloads, which is quite impressive. And recently, he also came to Beijing. During his time in Beijing, he once again gave his analysis on why Asia will return to the global stage as the driving force and why the West is misunderstanding Asia horribly. The structural reasons that the West is refusing to accept this reality. And also, he gave his analysis on how can we deal with these geopolitical tensions when we are living in this turbulent world. So what I'm going to do in this video is showing you Professor Mikishwa Mamabani's speech and his answers with the media. And I was there at this press conference. If you are curious about his analysis, if you are curious why the West is, is failing horribly and why Asia is rising, take a look at this video. What I propose to do in my remarks today is to leave with you th three big ideas, which in some way or another possibly explain the success of the book. The first big idea, and I'll say a little bit about that, is that the Asian century is real. It is happening, even though the Western media doesn't report it. The second big idea is that there are structural reasons why the West is refusing to accept the idea of the Asian century. And I'll explain the structural reasons. And third, at the same time, the third big idea I want to leave with you is that Asians should not be complacent. Even though the Asian century is real, there are challenges, there are problems, and the Asian growth and development can be derailed if we are not careful. So these are the three big ideas. So why, why is the Asian century happening? And there are, there are many reasons for it. And the first and the most obvious reason why the Asian century is happening is that it is a perfectly natural development. Now, what do I mean by the natural, as a natural development? Well, the most important thing to know is that if you look at the past 2,000 years of world history, for 1,800 out of the two past 2,000 years, in 1,800 out of the past 2,000 years, the two largest economies of the world were always those of China and India. So it's only in the last 200 years that Europe took off and then North America took off. But the past 200 years of Western domination of world history have been an aberration. It's been abnormal. So what we are seeing in the 21st century is the exit of the abnormal and the return of the normal. 
where China, India, and the other Asian countries are once again becoming, emerging as the largest economies in the world. And this is a result, by the way, this is all a result of the fact that for most of human history, Asian societies performed on par with European societies. We were on par. And then, of course, something magical happened in the West. They had the Renaissance, they had the Enlightenment, uh, other developments, and the West leapt ahead of the rest of the world. And after leaping ahead, conquered the whole world. <laughs> I mean, even this city, Beijing, 120 year, years ago, was ravaged by forces from the West. You know, incredible treasures of Beijing destroyed by Western soldiers. That was Western power at its peak over 100 years ago. But that's the past. And now we're back. Asians are back. And Asians, as you know, make up the majority of the world's population. 55%. And if we perform on par, we will have the largest economies in the world. So that's one reason. It's a return to normal. But the other reason is that the Asian societies have also learned from the West how to succeed. And I actually wrote a whole book on it called The New Asian Hemisphere, in, published in uh, 2008 in the year of the Beijing Olympics. <laughs> explaining how Asian societies have succeeded by, you know, having understood, absorbed, and implemented seven pillars of Western wisdom. You know, ideas like free market economics, mastery of science and technology, rule of law, you know. So all these things we have learned and we are implementing. And something that is ex absolutely strange that is happening in the world today which is again underreported, is that while the Asian societies are embracing some of the successful Western ideas, the West is walking away from its own successful ideas. Now, this is not an exaggeration, okay? Just to give you a simple, I mentioned how mastery of uh, free market economics is why Asian societies are succeeding. And one thing the United States always used to say, I remember in the 1980s when I was in the United States, I spent almost a decade there. And they said, we must open up our economies, liberalize, sign free trade agreements. And the United States was pushing for free trade agreements in the 1980s. But today, the US Congress cannot pass a single free trade agreement Free trade is dead in the US, and the world's largest free trade agreements are being signed here in East Asia. And in January 2022, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, uh, launched by the 10 ASEAN countries, including China, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, took off. And that's an example of how things are changing, right? The world's largest free trade agreements should have been created in the West, but they can't. And now Asians are doing so. And this is, of course, true in many areas. Huh? For example, I mean, a very simple thing. You know, when you, when you come to China, what always stuns you is the infrastructure. Now, as you know, in theory, China is the number two power and United States is the number one power, right? And so in theory, the number one power should have the best infrastructure in the world. But amazingly, if you want to see first world airports come to Asia, <laughs> Beijing has got two first world airports, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Singapore, even Delhi, Mumbai, have amazing airports. But if you want to see third world airports, you go to the United States. <laughs> John F. Kennedy Airport is a nightmare, right? It's a nightmare. And there are many airports like that. And even President Joe Biden has said, how is it that the United States of America, the most advanced country in the world, doesn't have a single airport in the top 25 airports in the world? <laughs> Amazing. So these are examples of how things are changing and how power and growth are shifting to Asia. And the thing that's important here is that 
most of the world can see this happening and understand that this is real, right? And they can see the data. I mean, just for a simple example, in the year 2000, in, in nominal market terms, the U.S. economy was eight times the size of China's economy. Now it's only 1.5, 1.3 times bigger, right? That's how fast China has grown. But other parts of Asia have also grown. Another statistic, if you look at the ASEAN countries, 10 ASEAN countries in the year 2000, I'm going to compare with Japan because Japan was then the second largest economy in the world in the year 2000. Japan's economy was eight times bigger than ASEAN. Today, Japan's economy is only 1.5 times bigger than ASEAN. And around 2030, ASEAN will become bigger than Japan. Isn't that amazing? Right? Amazing. And if you look at the trade statistics, the world's largest trade flows are also coming from Asia. So you can see, and I can give you data on that too, how all this is showing the shift of power to Asia. And it's very clear. You know, I must emphasize that we are in the year 2023. We still have 77 years left in the Asian century. And it's a lot is going to happen over the next 77 years. And this is what this book does. It provides you a glimpse into that future that is coming. So that's the first big idea, that the Asian century is real. The second big idea I want to leave with you is to explain to you the structural reasons why the West is reluctant to accept the idea of the Asian century. And the structural reasons are a result of the fact that because of the past 200 years of Western domination of world history, the West occupies a lot of geopolitical space in the world. It controls many important organizations and it doesn't want to give up its control. Even though this control is a result of them having a lot of power 100 years, 50 years ago, the power has diminished. They should cede control. They don't want to. They want to maintain control. And the most obvious example uh, comes from the two largest uh, two most important economic organizations in the world, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. And these were created after World War II. At that time, as you know, and this was an incredible achievement by the United States. The United States in 1950, soon after World War II, with 5% of the world's population had a 50% share of global GNP. That's how powerful the United States was. But that was unnatural, as I said. And now the US has come down. Still, it's still the number one economy. It maybe has 20% of the world's GNP, but not 50% anymore, right? And clearly, power has shifted, right? But despite the fact that power has shifted, you still have a rule in the IMF that says to become the head of the IMF, you must be a European. To become the head of the World Bank, you must be an American. And even though the most dynamic, successful economies in the world are Asian economies, no Asian citizen can run either the IMF or the World Bank. And I can tell you, by the way, it's an important historical fact. In the year 2009, at the height of the global financial crisis, when the West was in deep trouble, they agreed that, oh, okay, okay, we will no longer dominate the IMF and the World Bank. Future heads of the IMF and World Bank will be selected on merit and not on the basis of geography. They made that commitment in 2009. 14 years have gone by. They have not fulfilled that commitment. They are still controlling this organization. And the way they do it, by the way, so you understand, 
is that in the IMF especially, a country's share of voting power should represent its share of the global economy. But I can tell you, as recently as 10 years ago, <laughs> three small states, Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg, had a greater voting share than China in IMF. Shocking. But even today, now China's share of the global GNP maybe is what, 16, 17, maybe 18%. You can, you can check. But China's share of IMF voting shares is only 6%. It should not be 6%. It should be 16 17%. But I can tell you, the West will resist the change because they don't want to give up the power. And I can tell you, the world will have a real, the IMF will have a real problem when China becomes the number one economy in the world because as Christine Lagarde, when she was head of the IMF, she said, in the constitution of the IMF, it says, that the headquarters of IMF shall always be in the capital of the largest economy in the world. <laughs> That's why it's in Washington, D.C. But when China becomes the world's largest economy, and if the IMF tries to leave Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C. will explode. Now, I'm giving you this as examples of for why there are structural reasons why the West doesn't want to accept the Asian century. Because if they accept that this is an Asian century, they have to learn to share power with the rest of the world. And they don't want to. You know, people get used to the power. There's always a huge time lag. And that's why the Western media also continues to pretend that the Asian century is not happening. It's related to that structural reason. So that's the second big idea I want to leave with you. The third big idea I want to leave with you is we in Asia, sh at the same time, should not be complacent. <laughs> we still have a long way to go in our development. We have done very well, succeeded very well, but we got to be careful because there can be threats and there can be difficulties in our growth and development. So I can tell you, for example, the biggest danger uh, to growth and development in Asia is war. Because to develop, you must have peace. And if there's no peace, you can't develop. And so far, uh, touch wood, it's amazing, right? that since the end of the Cold War, right, in 1990, the guns have been silent in Asia. That's quite remarkable, by the way, because when the Cold War ended, you will find in this book, Asian 21st Century, I cite some Americans who say that Europe's past, you know, Europe had the biggest wars in the past, World War I, World War II, and all that, will be Asia's future. So at the end of the Cold War, everyone thought the wars would happen in Asia and Europe would be in peace. Now we know, right? 33 years after the end of the Cold War, Asia has been at peace and Europe has been at war. You know, you had the Yugoslav wars, you had, now you have this massive Ukraine war. And I can tell you, as I again say in an essay in this book, Wars are the result of geopolitical incompetence. And one idea that the Europeans refuse to accept is that the Ukraine war could have been prevented. All wars can be prevented if you work hard to achieve a political compromise that is acceptable to all the parties. And an imperfect political compromise that delivers peace is better than a perfect war. And here I can tell you that one organization that is genuinely underappreciated by everybody in the world, and even sadly underappreciated in, in Asia, is ASEAN. Because the, one of the key reasons why East Asia is at peace 
is because of ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. And that's why I wrote a book called The ASEAN Miracle, because ASEAN has the one organization. It is a very weak organization, but because it is so weak, everybody trusts it. It's the only organization that can invite United States, Russia, China, Japan, South Korea, European Union to come for meetings. The convening power of ASEAN is phenomenal. But by bringing the countries together, they have also helped to improve relations and sometimes maybe even have prevented wars. I can tell you in the late 1990s, when there was a quarrel between China and Japan and they couldn't talk, leaders couldn't talk to each other bilaterally, they came to an ASEAN meeting and then they talked to each other. And that's what ASEAN does. And ASEAN is underappreciated. So... Therefore, because, just because we have achieved peace over the last, as I said, 33 years, we should not be complacent. We should ensure that this doesn't happen in the region. So we have to continue working hard, both domestically as well as internationally to preserve peace in the region. But I'm going to conclude with just one last statistic, because this statistic, I hope, will explain why I continue to remain optimistic for the future of Asia and why, in fact, this statistic alone can explain why with Asian century will happen. Now, as you know, uh, the, the, if you look at it, I want to focus on three fast growing parts of Asia, what I call the new CIA. Now, CIA doesn't stand for Central Intelligence Agency. CIA stands for China, India, and ASEAN. And this makes up almost 40% of the world's population because if you add the 1.4 billion people in China, 1.4 billion people in India, almost 700 million people in uh, ASEAN, you get 3.5 billion people. Now, out of 3.5 billion people in this CIA countries, in the year 2000, when the 21st century began, in the year 2000, the total middle class population was only 150 million. Only 150 million out of uh, 3.5 billion of the middle class. But by 2020, three years ago, that number had exploded 10 times to 1.5 billion people. And by 2030, that number may be 2.5 to 3 billion people. Now, just look at that. Asia has now produced the world's largest middle-class population, which also means that the world's largest markets will now be in Asia. And this will be where people will come, you know, to seek growth and development. So this, it is statistics like this that explain why the rest of the world understands that the Asian century is happening, and why the West still refuses to accept that the Asian century is happening. Thank you very much. So I have two questions. I will try to make it very simple. First is about the disputes among Asian countries. Asian countries, we have border disputes, we have conflicts, and also America sees this region as uh, their battlefield with, uh, to control Indo-Pacific, and they put military bases in different Asian countries. And that will, of course, coerce countries to take a side during, uh, between the China-U.S. confrontations. So do you think even we have all these disputes and conflicts among each other, this will continue to be a 21st Asian century? And second one is the rise of the global south, because there's a trend in Africa, is working together, African Union, Pan-Africanism, uh, Latin America through CELAC. So do you think they are the great competitor with Asia, the whole region of Asia, which is more competitive to be the leader of the 21st century? There will always be, by the way, uh, almost every country in the world has bilateral problems with its neighbor, right? I mean, even take two countries like United States and Canada, they have the friendliest relationship. But they've had border disputes also, okay? So it's, it's normal to have border disputes. So this, but the question is how you manage them. You can either choose to go to war over border disputes, or you can negotiate. And so far, again, touch wood, in the, the, the lot of negotiations are taking place. And as long as you can have negotiations and peaceful resolution, then I think we are okay. 
in, in the region. But of course, the, as I said earlier, we should not be complacent. We should not, we should definitely try to uh, uh, take proactive measures to prevent conflict in our region. And we and, and, and so if there are border disputes and all, keep talking about them, but avoid a uh, uh, a conflict over them. And I'm reasonably confident that, you know, we've managed to keep the gun silent in East Asia for, th or, or, as I said, already 33 years. Let's keep it up, right? Uh, now, on the question of the global south, uh, I think the it'd be good for the world if all if everyone does well, if Asia does well, if Africa does well, if Latin America does well. But it is not a secret that so far in the last 20 years, for example, the growth of the e Asian countries has been much better than the growth of the African countries or the growth of uh, the Latin American countries. And in fact, uh, it's a bit surprising how the, Latin America, as you know, their per capita income is higher than many Asian countries, but their growth has been stalling. Take the Argentinian economy, it is struggling still, sadly, you know. Uh, so if you look at the objectively at the track record, there's no question that overall, most Asian countries, not all Asian countries, okay, most Asian countries are doing well, and I think will continue to do well over the next 10 to 20 years.